want to do tonight, uh, we want to end out our series with um, talking about ways to be better allies in our community, whether it's being an ally when it comes to our neighbors of color, whether it's being a better ally when we see any inequities um, in terms of the women that you are around, whether it's um, being an ally to our brothers and sisters um, in our gay communities. This, this is just um, a really a time for us to talk about what does allyship look like? Um, and then Jerisa and I are the presenters tonight to really talk about in our experience, what are some of the best ways people have been allies to us? Um, and really kind of closing this out to, um, to consider then finally, what are you going to commit to? And this isn't just intended to, this was, you know, six weeks of education. And tonight is the time for our, our, for our folks who are still with us to really think about what is it that they are going to, you're going to commit your time to um, in terms of reducing inequity in our communities, because we all have to do something. We all have to work towards that community and that type of neighborhood and the type of nation that we want our children to grow up in. Um, I've seen one too many signs at protests that I've been to that I've seen on TV with 70 and 80 year old women with signs that say, I can't believe I still have to protest this. Right. And I tell you what, I don't want to be 70 and 80 years old protesting some of the things that we see in our communities today. I would really like to see commitments from those people who say that they love their community and they want their community to be better to take hard looks at where we do have these inequities and commit to working on them because it can't always be people of color doing the work. It can't always be women working on women's issues. It can't always be just those in, uh, in the gay community working on gay rights. It has to be all of us and it has to be all of us taking a really hard deep look at our biases and then really having conversations with folks when you hear their implicit biases or explicit biases come out in conversation so that's just how i wanted to start tonight i'm feeling um Honestly, I'm feeling a little emotional tonight um, at the end of all of this and um, what, what I hope that folks will take away from what they learned over the last several weeks. So, Jerisa, I'll let you have, do your opening and then we can <laughs> talk about. <laughs> well, I mean, absolutely. I echo everything that um, Dr. Lovell said. Um, it's important that, you know, we are out here doing the work, very obviously, but um, when more join the party, we can have greater effect on change. So um, that's what this has all been about. You know, I know it's been entertaining, um, and we hope that you all have enjoyed being with us on Thursday evenings, but this wasn't solely for entertainment's purpose. Um, it was educational, and we wanted it to be inspirational as well. So we wanted you all to take what you what you got from us and apply it to your community. So that's exactly where we want to end today. I think it's a great um, pinnacle that we've came to. We've had several people ask both of us, you know, hey, are you all going to continue rise? Um, this is kind of like what my grandmother used to say is like, no, now it's time for you to do your part. Um, so we've given you rise. We've educated you. We've spent Thursday evenings with you for the last seven weeks. If this is something that you'd like to see continue, maybe that's the way that you can build equity in your community. We would be happy to assist, um, but it takes more than just, you know, Councilwoman Seabrooks, Dr. Lovell, and myself to make change happen. We've all got to commit. And I think what's very important, um, and I think it's just like the first thing that people need to look at are those implicit biases. 
And so I really want to break down the word implicit because I think a lot of people, you know, they come to me with the language that like, well, I love everybody. You know, I, I treat everybody the same. I treat everybody equal. Maybe that doesn't always work sometimes. Maybe it's time for people to, to look deeply within themselves and see, you know, this is the same as, um, I think this is, was, was you, somebody mentioned this last week, I can't remember. Um, but, you know, biases can be as simple and as non-hurtful as you're behind somebody who's driving really slow and you're behind them and you say, that must be an old person. That is a bias. So what I'm saying is biases look really, they don't always look like, you know, the name calling or the taunting or the, the, the overt things. They can be just as simple as, you know, telling behind somebody and thinking it, just assuming it's an old person because they're driving slow. So we've all got to look inside. So we have some ways that we're going to talk with you about, about how you can look in, into your biases. And then you got to do the work. Then you got to do the work to, to conquer those biases. And it, the work never, it never stops because human beings never stop evolving, adapting, and changing. So um, I guess that's my opening. I'm, I'm just really big on everybody doing introspection themselves. And then I live by the mantra that my grandma nanny used to say. She's an old Southern woman, didn't have anything past an eighth grade education, but she always told me, don't worry about what other people are doing. You do your part. And as long as everybody in the community is doing their part, then, then that's where unity and change happens. So I, that's my opening. So let's talk about some of the ways that we've seen that have been really positive in our work, that people have been important allies to us in how we do it, and in ways it hasn't exactly sometimes worked the best, and kind of those pitfalls of what to avoid in being an ally. Um, I, I, what's worked best for me, and we, I mean, this has been a reoccurring theme on RISE, is mentorship. Mm -hmm. We have to, 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 to get where we're at, and we have to bring people along. Mm -hmm. You got to bring people along. Mentorship has been so impactful to me in my journey, in my career, and my personal life. I mean, I wouldn't be the mother that I am right now if it hadn't been for a young lady that I worked with who was a teenage mom when I didn't have children. And I used to look at her crazy. One day she told me, I can't ever put my kids on the bus. And I thought, oh my God, what a, what a bubble head. Like just put them on the bus. Then I had kids of my own and I watched those little legs get on the bus and it became quite different for me. So mentorship. Um, and then another th recurring thing I think has came up a lot is support. We've got to support each other. Um, we all have weaknesses, pitfalls, downfalls, and we've got to, you know, we got to pick each other up every once in a while and say, it's okay, dust yourself off and keep going. Mm -hmm. Mentorship and support, that's kind of what, those are the two biggest themes for me that have been impactful for my life. Um, and just speaking up when I say something, which sometimes people don't like a whole lot, but it's got to be done. Yeah. So I, I want to follow on what you were saying about support, because sometimes people wonder, well, what do you mean by support? Like what, what kinds of things can I, I do? And, you know, some of the most important things for me in terms of support um, are, you know, if you're, so if I'm in a meeting and I say something that needs to be said, that's hard about, you know, race and maybe the ways that, you um, you know, we're not doing everything, everything we can for our students and what we need to be thinking about. And instead of waiting until afterwards to tell me, I really liked what you had to say, folks jump up at that point in the meeting and say, I like what you're saying. What can we do? What can I do? Speak it in the moment. Don't wait till afterwards. Mm -hmm. And especially speak it in the moment if you're feeling it and it is a heated moment because oftentimes when people of color are making those points in a meeting and being the one to speak it and nobody jumps in and says, yes, you are right. We need to think about that. Then they just see it as our personal problem. And we'll get a little sociological here. We call, that's what we call personal troubles in sociology and not something that's a wider societal trouble. They see it as just me having the problem as opposed to, yes, this is really the reality of our students of color and our people of color. We've got to think about this. So 
you got to support us in the moment when you agree with us and when you, you feel what we're saying. Also in terms of support, you know, for the folks that are out, for folks that are out front doing this work, sometimes it really feels like, um, unfortunately, it feels like a firing squad. Uh, <laughs> Teresa's laughing and shaking her head. So Monday, I did um, implicit bias and microaggression training for all of the teachers in the in Elizabethtown Independent School District. It was, a, you know, and we had to do it virtually because that is the world of COVID. And so you don't have those cues like, you know, how are people feeling? Are they bristling at what you're saying? Those sorts of things. Um, and so it even, it makes you feel as the trainer, even more vulnerable when you're doing that kind of work. And support can be, you know, for those of us that are out there doing it, you know, the other day, a friend of mine out of the blue, she said, you know, I know you're doing these dry sessions on Thursday night. I know that's got to be impacting your family. And she, she gave me a meal for my family on that night. And you know, you, you've got to, we've got to look at the people who are doing the work and figuring out how to support them in multiple levels. So that way, because that meant the world to me that they, that they supported us in those kind of ways as well. So, so, you know, support can come from all different sorts of, sorts of things. Um, I see Chelsea on here tonight. She, she brought me bread one week. You know, I mean, that's, that support, that's saying we care, you know, and, and sometimes you just, um, when you take so many hits in a week or in a month when doing this work, because it is not roses and, you know, dancing in fields and those sorts of things. It is hard, emotionally taxing work. Um, that sometimes you, do you ever feel like, like Danielle, that sometimes you're fighting tiny little battles? That's what I feel like every day. Like I'm in this all out war. Yeah. And I fought like, you know, tiny little battles and came out with a lot. Some battles I come out with a lot of nicks and some I come out with, with large, uh, large scale wounds. But I, yeah, it's, it's like fighting a, an isolated war with tiny little battles inside. That's, that is such a good way to explain it. And so, you know, one of the ways that you take the, some of those nicks off the folks that are speaking up and out is that you also speak up and out because then, then those folks who are speaking out aren't doing it alone and we need more people to be vocal. Um, I think that's, that's one of the best ways that I've seen in terms of support is yeah. all those little things. Cause it, it adds up to make a huge difference. Yeah. And I like what you said about it. You know, supporting someone doesn't always have to be very hard work. It can be just as simple as just reaching out to say, Hey, is there any, Thing I can do for you or just not even asking just kind of knowing that hey, we all have to eat you know we all have child children we some of us have children it can be as simple as hey let me take the kids to the park for you for about 30 minutes or an hour while you get to your school work or whatever it may be I mean so support doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be you know picketing or you know, if that's not your thing or protesting it's okay yeah, there's, and I think that's an important thing when we talk about allyship. There is so many, so many different avenues that takes. I mean, you know, if you're someone who, who likes to write, um, you know, get those postcards out or your email out and start writing to those people who make the policies that impact some of the issues we've been talking about the most. Um, other people aren't really good with that, you know, and, and so they might take on a, a different aspect of it. Um, but there's just, you know, there's a lot of unique ways that, that people can become involved that is within their comfort zone. But also, I don't want folks to think, well, I just got to do what, what I'm comfortable with. Because part of being an ally is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. And we've got to, um, and, and that's, that's hard for everybody. It's hard for Jerisa and I when we're out there speaking on these things, let alone um, if it's the first time you're speaking up. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is a given and this is, you know, with any leadership concept, uncomfortable will make you grow. It will help you to develop. So those feelings of, of discomfort, 
when you finally conquer them and you come out on the other side, you've come out a more developed, more refined person that's, to me, better connected with the world. So we all got to get uncomfortable sometimes. That's a very good point, Donnie. Awesome. So if you, um, we're going to continue our conversation back and forth, but as you're thinking, go ahead and use the chat box and shoot us some questions you have about being an ally as well. And we'll start addressing those as we weave this into um, some of the other points we wanna make tonight. Um, that way we can all um, engage. You know, I originally switched to this webinar because our, uh, this particular mode, because our numbers. Um, and so then it, it makes it hard for us to engage with the webinar mode. And I really, um, you know, Zoom one day will fix that too. So I'm sure I have faith that they will because <laughs> they probably already had complaints. Um, but some of the other things that have really, um, you know, in, in terms of being an ally, you've got to do your work and the reading part and the watching the documentaries part and the, um, without expecting someone else to educate you all the time. Like that, be, being a good ally is, is really digging deep into um, so many wonderful books that are out there written by um, people who have experienced the things that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, we have uh, to do that. It's, you know, something that as a minority and a female, I will tell you that gets really hairy is why is it always up to the oppressed people to teach the oppressor? <laughs> it's, it's up to you guys to dig deep. And, you know, there's all kinds of Amazon book lists. There's Barnes and Noble book lists. You've got your community college professors. You've got your university professors. There's all kinds of ways that you can um, elevate your mind, okay? So it's not always me. You know, I had a couple of phone calls during the George Floyd, um, uh, I'm gonna say murder because it's what it was and uh people what can i do you have sometimes you have to figure that out i can tell you to do something that i feel like works for me uh as to prove my methods of being anti-racist but that may not work for you so that that good point you've got to find ways that you can support and educate yourself that work for you like for me hey up here lately i've been up at three or four o'clock in the morning so i have caught every american experience documentary <laughs> on KET. <laughs> um but hey it gave me the opportunity to watch one with stacy abrams and um that was the one of the resources that we ended up using i mean i closed down that documentary and just because i've never ran for office so i don't have that perspective i don't know how it feels um so watching that educated me on females like Dr. Lovell who have run for office, the type of the encounters and circumstances that they enter into and, and their obstacles. So yeah, I mean, you, you have to do the work yourself. You absolutely do. That's, that's the lifelong learning aspect of this. Um, you know, so as I was preparing to do the training for E-Town Independent, of course, I I got to dig deep into the literature and I got to see what the newest information is out there. Um, I always take the implicit bias tests again, you know, as I'm preparing to, to yes. use them to teach, you know, I go and take them. And every time I take one, I learn something new. And so Sunday night I was taking the implicit bias test on race because that's one of, one of the ones I was going to ask them to go ahead and to do. And I got finished and, you know, the first time I took some of these tests were 20 years ago. And so, I mean, this is a lifelong journey of taking these tests every, you know, so often just to see kind of where we're at. And, you know, kind of, I've, I've been coming back in the last several years, you know, where it tells me I don't really have a slight preference either way. Um, for whether it's white or um, people of color. And, and that's kind of where you want to be, right? Well, when I did it Sunday night, it was showing that I had a preference for people of color. And I was like, man, Jason, that's my husband. And, you know, what it boiled down to was that with everything happening right now, that I just might feel more comfortable right then and there, you know, yeah. when it comes to that. And you know what? I was totally open and honest with that in the training I did with E-Town Independent. 
because our biases are some are things that are always changing because of the world around us, the events around us, what we're experiencing. Um, that's why the lifelong learning aspect of being an anti-racist and looking at what policies are going to work for different people in 2020 versus what worked for them in 2010. Um, you know, just we've got to constantly be immersing ourselves in those perspectives. So that way we're catching new things that might arise. And then I, then I was able to reflect on, okay, so why am I there? What can I do about that? What do I need to do to kind of, um, heal maybe right um so that way that it's it's not showing up in that way um so it's I, i've been doing trainings like this for I, i've been i took my first implicit bias training over like 20 years ago mm -hmm. and for me. yeah I, and i learned something new every time and so it's not something you don't do anti-racist training one time and say okay i'm trained it's it's every day and it's educating yourself as much as possible. Absolutely. Because we come across new experiences that shape those biases every day. So you've got to keep doing the work mm -hmm. and create me. And I know you're like me too, Danielle. I enjoy taking those tests. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I merged in my career. It's like, Oh yeah, I would take the test again and see where I'm at. Yeah. Um, something that might be interesting for me because of the way that I grew up, I didn't grow up around a whole lot of black females <clears throat> or black males for that point. My family was, was predominantly black female, but I found out I had biases against other black females <sighs> because when I was in grade school and middle school, I was bullied a lot by black females. So, uh, you know, that's something that I experienced in college and I really had to check myself mm -hmm. because I was, I, my bias caused me to isolate myself away from people because out of fear, because of the experiences that I had had with other black females. So when I would encounter other black females, I automatically bought up this defense. You know, I was in, I was in full beast fight mode until, you know, you start coming across other people who don't fit um, those, bi fit your biases. So, I mean, that's some, I, I wanted to point that out there because I think that's really interesting. You might not see that a black female might have biases against other black females because she is one but it depends on what experiences that she has had throughout life. Biases are both things that are, that have to do with both our in-group and our out-group. It's, mm -hmm. it's not something that's one or the other, it's both. And that's why this self-reflection is really important. And I know this sounds very, you know, um, I don't know. I, I've got accused one time in a training that, well, this is just, this is just too much like therapy which is then the bias against mental health, right? <laughs> but, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, we, we've got to all do that kind of therapeutic work to think about, um, to, to think about those. And it's also important to remember about implicit biases is that, you know, not as only the in-group and the out-group, um, but that, where was I going with that? Oh my goodness. Well, that one just totally left my mind and it'll come back to me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, but, you know, again, that's, that's just one of those, those key pieces of this. Mm -hmm. um, it is. You know, we can never I, I, know I think, everything. No, you don't. And, that, and that's a lot of times what people were, you know, were asking me. I've had faculty that will approach me and ask me, how do I cover this issue in class? Just cover it. Go ahead and say up front, I don't know everything. I don't know a thing about, actually, I, maybe I don't even know how to, to bring this to you, but I want to know. I need to know more of it. And just saying that in front of a classroom of students, is going to help them to open up. You don't always have to, to set up with the right opening and the most prolific and professional opening. Set down, dig down with those students and, and create those spaces for those students to say the things that they need to say. Maybe you don't say the right for the right thing, but maybe somebody in that classroom is going to teach you how you can swing it the next time. And digging down with your colleagues as well. Um, you know, we hear, you know what, we hear implicit biases around us and we let them slide way too often. We might hear a colleague, um, you know, 
kind of rattle off a stereotype that we know needs to be a little more nuanced and it's not exactly the way it is and we let it slide and we don't address it and we've got to be more comfortable with challenging that a little bit about the stereotypes we hear um, you know biases are the stories we make up about people before we get to know them and Verna Myers, she's a, she has done a lot of TED Talks on implicit bias, and that's what she likes to say. Um, and it's one of my favorite things because it's so true. Um, and so when we yeah. hear somebody else making up a story by using a stereotype, we've got to be brave. You've got to be brave mm -hmm. and call that out. And, mm -hmm. and that can be hard. It is especially hard these days where... I mean, the rhetoric is so deep. So yeah, it is. Hard. It's it's so polarized. There's no middle anymore. And that's a really dangerous place to be in. We, as humans, we have to have that middle ground, but everything is like really polarized right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's yeah. But, you know, we, maybe if we start, maybe if we start talking again, even with those, those hard, you know, that's, that's not exactly true, right? We start listening and we start talking with the people around us again and talking to people who are not like us. Um, yeah. You know, we can start to, to move some of those really harsh polarizations that we have these days. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just, you know, critical. Um, so I just want to, just for a few minutes, um, some of the things that aren't, maybe is helpful in terms of being an ally. And there's one I wanna start with because this, is, this happens to me quite often. And, um, and I, I've realized what I've done is I have um, sanitized myself in a lot of ways. And I do mean that, I've you know, kind of boiled myself down. I've, I've you know, because mm -hmm. tone policing is, is really harmful in terms of trying to build those relationships and be an ally. So if I'm particularly passionate and that passion is coming through in my voice, um, or even, you know, if I'm, if I'm angry, it's, it's okay. It is okay for those kind of emotions to be expressed. And tone policing is when, you know, you might say to someone it's not about what they're saying because what they're saying is true but it's about well you know if maybe you weren't so emotional if maybe you weren't so um, pointed with your words and you used different words the message might be better received um you know i i'm um especially in the last several months, I have to say, I've had it about up to here with being tone policed on some of these issues because I've been talking about them for 20 years and I sanitized myself for a really long time. And I, you know, I, I made sure I moderated my voice for a really long time. I made sure I used the right words for a really long time and we're still here. So I don't think my tone is what matters. <laughs> I agree. And, and you know, you've known me for a long time, Danielle. I'm a very passionate person. Sometimes I get very loud. Um, and I've, I've also been tone policed as well. I didn't know there was a term for that. <laughs> but yeah, I've definitely been tone policed before, you know, even during the midst of, uh, of, of everything that was going on with, with George Floyd. Um, I felt like sometimes I was very sad sometimes getting on Zoom calls and, and, and angry at times. And I felt like people were not letting me be in my space. Like automatically there were people coming at me like, well, all lives matter and police lives matter. And it's, it's a constant, for me as a black female, it's a constant silencing. So that's, that's kind of where I feel, um, I think that's another way that people fall out of being good allies. When, when somebody is telling you their experience or their story or their perspective, you don't always have to come back with, well, this happened to me, or I've experienced this. Sometimes it's just there for you to listen to the experience and just learn from it. You don't always have to be in a comparative type nature. 
even if you do have something similar, maybe you just need to listen sometimes. And it's in those spaces that you learn a whole lot. That's what I saw a whole lot going on, you know, um, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, there's a, it's a Marxist racist, you know, movement. Have you really done a lot of research in it? Do you know what spawned BLM? Do you know why? Um, and so just listen, do your research. Again, we'll go back to that. And if somebody tells you, you know, hey, when I saw George Floyd on TV, that hurt. You know, I've, I've actually seen videos of people saying that that, that, he, that wasn't the same cop. Or, oh my gosh, guys, stop. The facts were right there. <laughs> And don't denounce people's experiences. I think that's where I'm going. You know, don't try to change the narrative to make it fit you or make you comfortable, mm -hmm. shall I say. One of the things that I teach in my research methods classes with my students, um, that when you're doing particularly qualitative research, meaning that you know, you're listening to stories and you're wanting people to share challenging and difficult things that have happened in their lives so you can use that to better understand a specific social phenomenon. We are so trained in this society to listen to respond and not to listen just to take in what is being said. And so we spend a lot of time in research methods trying to break that habit of always listening ahead. Well, how am I going to respond to this? How am I going to respond to this? Sometimes it's not about that. Yeah. And in research and in doing this work, it's about the listening. Yeah. And there may not be a response. It's just to listen. Absolutely. I think that that's two, thing, two key takeaways is listening and empathy. Like, and it's very different than sympathy. I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me as a black woman. Not all my experiences have been terrible. What I'm asking you for you to do is when I tell you that all my experiences haven't been good, I want you to have empathy and try to understand where I'm coming from. Um, you don't always have to completely grasp everything that I've been through because I've been through it, but you do need to try to listen to understand. And I, I think that's another big important part. Yeah. Yeah, to me, that's probably the, you know, our, our acronym, race, inequities, oh, yeah. solidarity, and empathy. Um, and the empathy piece, um, we've, I feel like we've, as society, we have um, hardened ourselves in a lot of ways to that empathy piece. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, it makes me sad. I don't want... Um, you know, these conversations are hard and, um, you know, my daughter's right upstairs and I come upstairs every Thursday night and she asks me, well, how did it go, mama? She wants to know. And you know what? Yeah. We talk about it. We, we yeah. talk about this. We, you know, my daughter is nine years old and there's no reason that we can't have conversations about what's happening at her level so that she starts early to understand how to be an ally because my little girl yeah. is going to grow up an incredibly different world than I grew up in as a blonde haired, green eyed little girl. And so it's my job to make sure that she's listening and being the best ally she can be to even her cousins who are four shades darker than her. And, and, and that's just, you know, that's, that's teaching our kids empathy. Oh it's one gosh. of the best ways that we can reclaim our own empathy, I think. I, I think that sometimes kids show better empathy than we do as adults. And sometimes we, like, I follow my kids lead sometimes. Like, you know, they'll tell me, you know, oh, mom, or, or you know, this, my, my kids' heart, their my kids' hearts are still so innocent and good, you know? And um, so I, I think it's important, yes. And I do the same thing on Thursdays. They wait until I say goodbye and they know I give the wave. And then we go, we talk about, you know, what they were, whatever the topic was. Mm -hmm. So Chelsea here, she says, I was preaching about whiteness and its impact on forming my childhood the other day. And I've realized in thinking about how much my implicit bias shaped me. 
My family passed on a lot of attitudes and assumptions about people of color, black people in particular, without ever or hardly ever saying anything out loud. So growing up, I was in a I was in diverse schools growing up in Memphis. My family never had people of color in our home, and I realized that as a child and even into adulthood and probably even now, I have an implicit preference for white people as friends, confidants, etc. We had this whitewashed intimate space mm -hmm. of our lives, and I think a lot of white people have this too. A couple of RISE sessions ago, we talked about how groups are segregated locally and we may not have connections across lines of difference. So I'm wondering how we begin to repair the social fabric in a real way and in a way that doesn't burden people of color or encourage white people to just find a black friend to make themselves feel better. Oh, Chelsea, is she your student? Danielle, is, is Chelsea a student of yours? She is not. She is actually a local minister at the Presbyterian Church here in Elizabethtown. Wow. I'm glad that there are people of faith that have that open mindset there. Mm -hmm. I, I would love nothing more to, I don't want to call them dialogue groups because that's too sterile, but mm -hmm. um in some way, and, and I think our churches can play such a pivotal role in this, in, um, you know, creating those spaces where we can get to know each other more, um, you know, whether it's sharing a meal, a community meal, or, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, food is one of the best ways that we relate across any lines that there are, right? right? And so how do we, you know, how do we create these spaces, whether it's, whether it's our churches, whether it's, you know, our, our, our community governments, you know, whether it's our county government, our local governments that also say, hey, yeah, we want to create that space for our communities to come together and share and share and get to know each other and, and be able to um, do that in a, in a really impactful way. Um, and, and, I, and there are, there are ways that it can be, can be done. And, and I think that would be a really powerful outcome of RISE if is, is if some of our groups, some of our churches in particular, kind of cross those racial lines and started. And can we say, Danielle, that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week? And I was going to let you say that. Said that to me. <laughs> said that to me one day and I was like, dang, she's spitting right there. She's speaking some knowledge. It is. Because all my yeah. life, when I went to church, when a white person walked into our church, we were like, what are they doing? <laughs> Always welcome, but it was just very shocking, you know? And mm -hmm. so as opposed to when I would go to church with my, my white friends from middle school, I felt out of place. And I'm sure mm -hmm. that they probably turned around like, what's she doing here? <laughs> so, I mean, I think if you're in a position of faith, Chelsea, I think that you have the power um, to, to arrange those types of, of things uh, where people can come together. I mean, potlucks always work. People sharing food of different cultures and just getting together to talk. Um, the community college is always a resource for you if you need, if you need assistance doing things like that. Um, so I, I think that's one of the ways. And, and just right now, Chelsea, what you're doing, attending these conversations like this and being open-minded and admitting to some of your biases and trying to conquer them, that is the way that, that you do it. You're, you're doing that and it's not a burden to me. Mm -hmm. You're doing that to educate yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, let me, let me tell you, let me clear something up. When you're doing things to educate yourself and you approach me as a minority black female, I want to help educate you. Mm -hmm. I want to help bring you out of that space that you have been in. Mm -hmm. So although I, I did say it, it's always up to the oppressed to, to teach the oppressor, it is and it isn't. Um, I just, I think that if we are able to educate and use these as teachable moments, and, and that's also where change can happen too. Mm -hmm. so, so in that, what she was thinking, I mean, she, she has clearly done a lot of thinking in that. And when, you know, when you come to the conversation with that deep level of self-reflection, you have started doing the work to allow then the conversation to kind of flow. It's, you know, it's, it's very different than the coming into the space and saying, what do I need to read? Or what do I need to do? Yeah. Or what do I, you know, the work is being done. And at that point, then, you know, it, it just makes it 
so much more fruitful. Yeah, and then you know how to ask, how to ask those hard questions, right? You know how to frame those hard questions because maybe you've read a narrative or two on people who have, uh, you know, who are minorities who have personal experiences, who've written bios and narratives. With that education, then you know how to frame hard questions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah, that's the key right there. I love I love that you said that, Chelsea. Thank you for, for sharing that and, and being vulnerable in this space um, and, 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 and being real with us as we talk about these things. It's so mm -hmm. important. So one of the things that Jerisa and I really have this really crazy idea, right? <laughs> so it's not just about sitting back and thinking, okay, yeah, that's, you know, I should probably do that. What, you know, what, what is it we should, you know, do? Well, you've got to speak it into the universe, right? You have to speak it. That way others can hold you accountable, uh -huh. right? For yeah. what you say you're going to do. And one of the things that Jerisa and I had this idea that we would create a hashtag called Hardin County Rise, R-I-S-E, and we would take a picture of ourselves with our commitment for others in our community to see what we are going to commit to in terms of helping to reduce inequities in our community. Because then I can see what you wanna work on and you can see what I wanna work on. And if there is overlap, then we have partnerships to do this stuff, okay? And so we want to, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask you guys to do that and to take those pictures on social media and use that hashtag. But also um, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to reach out to some key people in our community that have kind of floated in and out of our um, sessions, who've been able to attend several or maybe just one or two. And I'm going to ask them what kind of commitment they'd be willing to make public in terms of this work, because that is, that's where we want to go. What is, what are you willing to lay down on the line and say, this is what I want to work on. This is what I'm passionate about. Where are my people? Right. And one of the ways we can connect is through social media. So I'm going to read mine first. So I've got two because, well, I just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't leave the second one out. So my commitment to equity in our community is that I will help create more opportunities for education about those in the community who want to, for those in the community who want to learn more about race, social class, gender, or sexuality. And those are the areas that I really work on um, in my classes. And so those are the areas I'm really passionate about um, making sure we create spaces and opportunities to talk about them. And so my second one is one that, um, I've just really realized over the last several months just how much I've silenced myself. And so my commitment to equity in our community is that I will not allow others to silence me when the hard truths of the marginalized need to be heard. And I, and Jerisa is in these meetings with me. And so I expect her to help hold me accountable to that. Girl, sometimes I've got to sit on my tongue to shut up in meetings. <laughs> But that I will, um, I will speak those truths without worrying whether my passion is going to be too much for someone. Amen. So, Jerisa, I know you did yours. We've posted pictures online too with our signs already. <laughs> yeah. So, so my step towards equity in the community is encouraging minorities to follow me in my career pathway in higher education. Because the more of me that they see, the more of me's they can create. We've got to get minorities in those classrooms. We've got to get diversity in our, in our I mean, and it starts from preschool all the way up until post-secondary. You've got to be able to see those positive images of you. I'm just going to say, and I'm not going to mention any school, but my kids are getting ready to go to school. And I looked at the list of teachers. It was all white females. I don't think you know how that feels. I mean, and I mean, these are probably great, great seasoned, you know, educators. But for my child, I want her to have those positive teaching role models that look like her mommy or that look like her aunt. 
so that she knows. I mean, that, that lets a child know that it's possible for maybe them to be a teacher one day, maybe them to be faculty one day. So that is how I'm going to do it. Um, pretty easy for me to do because I work on a college campus, but it's important for me to do. Does anyone want to put what their commitment might be into the chat box so we can see it and that and what we might see on social media later of what you're willing to commit? There has to be some of the things that really spoke to you over the last several weeks. I'll give you all the run of the topics just in case any of the topics might spark your mind. Um, we've, we've started out the gate with education. We did workforce development. We did criminal justice reform. We did health care. We did women of color and running for politics. And tonight we're doing how to be an ally. I missed one. Which one did we I miss? We celebrated black business. We celebrated black business. So there are a myriad of ways that you can connect. Um, I, I made a whole, this whole comprehensive list for, for Danielle. And it was some of the what are included on the slides there. I mean, it could be easy as donating the scholarships that Western and ECTC have that support minorities going into education. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, you don't have to donate $100 a year. You can donate $10, $15 a paycheck. Mm -hmm. It goes a long way. You can show up, maybe ask faculty or your child's high school or middle school, come in there and be a guest speaker, especially if you're a minority business owner or somebody who's in a, an, um, a, a non-traditional career field like for women or for minorities. Um, you know, encourage kids to go into the STEM, to STEM, education. Those are, those are where we need to see. That's the impressionable moments for our kids. What are some other ways that I mentioned there, Donnie? Supporting people that are running. Uh-oh, we've got one. I had this feeling that Miss Megan Stiff would be one of the first ones. So she says, I'm going to make it a priority to find funding for new programs and scholarships for minority students. We have great ideas, but we need more resources to make them happen. And as the Institutional Advancement Officer at Elizabethtown Community and Technical College and the woman that can get money from, I, I, I you know, I bow down. Let me to I'm going to go back to one of my grandmother's sayings <laughs> there, Danielle. She can squeeze blood out of a turnip. That's yes, what my grandmother can. used to say. <laughs> And I know if Megan commits to that in a public space, she's going to make it happen. Right. That's exciting. Well, I, I do, I do want to say that Megan and I worked together to produce, to create the Equity Through Education Scholarship. There had never been a, a minority scholarship solely for just minorities at ECTC. So she was very, she helped me make that happen. It's one of the first things she came and sat down with me when, when on, her, on her first day of the job. What do you want to do? And she can tell you, it's one of the first things I mentioned. I want to provide some financial assistance to erase those non-academic barriers for our minorities. Mm -hmm. Love working with you, Megan. Thank you. That's awesome. I love that. So again, with this, this kind of work, it's speaking it into existence, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to speak it. You've got to set that goal. And then how, I'm gonna, how am I going to do that? And especially with, you know, especially with something that is so critical and so vital to who we are as a community and who we are as a county, who we are as a state, and who we are as a nation. We have to make those commitments loud and we have to, and have, to have others help us be accountable to what we say we're going to do when it comes to this kind of work. Um, and that's, that's what we want folks to come away with, um, with this. And, and knowing that they can call on their institutions of higher education. They can call on Elizabethtown Community and Technical College. You can call on Western Kentucky University um, to be there and to, um, to assist you in any way that you need to be able to get the work done. Don't forget, you have an entire campus of both WKU and ECTC faculty members from the areas of business and nursing and, you know, sociology and psychology, social work, education. I mean, we have got programs galore, yeah. right, with faculty in them that can help in whatever these areas are that you're interested in doing. 
Um, if you're interested in making sure we have more women and minorities in um, advanced manufacturing, well, guess what? We have both advanced manufacturing degrees at ECTC and advanced manufacturing degrees at WKU. So how do we And ECTC just received the Metallica Scholar Scholarship there we that's go. making it possible for people to go and pursue careers in or, uh, education and advanced manufacturing. So check that out. <laughs> exactly. That's where I was going with that too. That's great. <laughs> Sorry, I stole your thunder. Oh, no, that's your thunder because you're at ECTC. <laughs> <laughs> So again, it's, it's about finding what it is you want to work on and then, and then helping to make those connections in the community. And it's making sure that we're embedded in our communities in different ways and that we're serving in our community. And so when Radcliffe has their, if we ever get back to having festivals again, they have a wonderful multicultural festival out in Radcliffe every year awesome. that keeps growing and keeps growing. We've got to be out there supporting that. We've got to be out there supporting that. We've got to be right. participating in it. Um, you know, when we see churches doing different things, you know, maybe it's about getting out of our comfort zone and going to that event that's at a church we've never been to, in a part of town we've never been to, and just stepping out and saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to do that because that's important and I want to be involved. Again, that comfort zone, you got to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. <laughs> so we yeah. just have a few minutes left. You'll thank us for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you don't, then just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I, uh, uh, Dries and I are both going to just say a few things to close and, um, I, um, Dries, you go first. Okay. Um, this has been shoot, quite a ride. I'm not quite sure where our, I, I think we were all had like COVID brains when we first started this. Yeah, let's go seven weeks. Um, but it's been a, it's been a great ride and I've actually learned a great deal from this. Um, I know people think that, you know, my title of cultural diversity implies that I'm very diverse and very inclusive and very equitable. But, but that type of cultural competence is fluid. So through these, these conversations, I've, I've learned so much. Um, I, I can't pick out my favorite panel, but I will say I've had two favorite panels and that would of course be education. I mean, that, that's a given. Um, but the, the women of color in running for politics, I think it sticks out the most to me um, because I've said several times, Policy, guys, and voting is the way that we have to make a change. You've got to support those people who are supporting equitable legislation that is helping everybody be successful in, in life. Um, so that was the one that was most impactful for me. I've enjoyed, Danielle, you're a pleasure to work with. Um, Tanya, you were a pleasure to work with too. Megan, I, I, I do have to give her some credit. Megan approached me with this ideal and we just, we kind of took off with it. Um, but I'm glad she did because I, I didn't, I knew that we had to come into a space where we were able to open up and talk about some difficult, hard things. And I think we did that, but we didn't just leave you hanging. We gave you action items that you can use to, to encourage that change in your community. It's been a wild, crazy ride. Um, my kids ask me every Thursday, are you, are you doing rides? So, I don't know what they're going to do next Thursday. I'll actually be able to cook a meal and Papa John's isn't going to pull up in my driveway, but <laughs> it's been great. Um, and I do it all over again, just to educate some that, that are willing to be open-minded and come along for the ride. So thank you for working with me, Dr. Lovell. You're awesome. This, this really has been um, an important, an important part of my week every week. Um, getting, getting ready for this and connecting with Dries and Tanya several times a week to, you know, to figure out how we're going to best do, you know, what we want to get, get across and, and to get all of our panelists together. Um, and that's who, that's who I want to focus on. Um, yes, our panelists yes. over the last six weeks have been really amazing. And remember to reach out to those folks in those areas that you're interested in. Um, and, and any one of them would be willing and absolutely excited to have someone say, I saw you on Rise and 
I would love to talk with you more about this or partner on that or can, you know, what, whatever it may be. Um, I have learned so much every week. And I think that's, um, that's what I, I mean, gosh, this lifelong learning. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't get any mm -hmm. better when we can do no, something for free and bring people together every week. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to say, um, sometimes when it comes to this, things start to die down a little bit and we become complacent again. Yes. And we can't do that. Yeah. We can't do that we are at that tipping point where we have to make some changes in our society and how we treat people, how we treat people in poverty, how we treat people of color, how we treat those that are different than us. And it's time that, that we really um, did some of that, that hard soul searching work. Um, because as I started off with, I really don't want to be out there when Abigail's 45 years old Amen. and I'm 80 years old with my sign. <laughs> Amen. I, really don't. Um, I just, I have so many high hopes and so many, um, so many things I want to see for our future. And one of the ways that we do that is by all of us getting busy and getting to work. And I think this is a great way to, to start that. Yeah. Man, thank you all for being with us for the past seven weeks. I mean, like I said, we've had some very faithful listeners. So I really want to thank them for spending time with us every Thursday. Um, can't thank the panelists that, that were, I mean, five seconds after I'd send the email, they were right on it. They wanted this opportunity to speak to, to, speak to people and educate people. Um, all of our panelists were fantastic. Um, it's just been a really good thing. I'm almost kind of bit, oh my gosh, I'm getting a little bit galumped. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing we know for certain is that you will continue to see Jerisa and you will continue to see me and you will continue to see Tanya out in our community doing these things. And the question is, are you going to be out there right there with us doing them? And so that's what we want to see, right? We, we want to see more people on the front lines out there doing this work and um, calling attention to um, the challenges and opportunities we have to um, eliminate uh, so many of the inequities that we see in Hardin County. And you know what? We've been very, very blessed to be here with you the last seven weeks and reach out to either one of us at absolutely any time um, to, to think about how you want to take your work for, further. So with that, right on time at eight o'clock, we appreciate, <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to put Rise 2020 in the books. We are. We are. It has risen. It has. <laughs> it's risen. <laughs> So thank you, everyone. You have a lovely evening. And for those of us that are headed back into the classroom next week, Godspeed <laughs> as we face this. Yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. We'll see you later.